Your smartphone can take amazing pictures. This is Solo Travel Talk. Your solo travel advisor is Astrid Clements. Taking snapshots on a trip is probably as old as daguerreotypes. With the dominance of social media, showing off travel pics is even more of an expectation and maybe even a challenge. When you get down to it, travel photos are about capturing memories. Astrid, travel blogger, social media maven, travel picture taker, she is sure to have some tips. Astrid, you actually took a course on travel photography from National Geographic, the gold standard of adventure photography. I must say, National Geographic and their photography expeditions and workshops are fabulous. They are, to me, definitely as good as as you can get in terms of combining travel and photography skills. I mean, their their trips, their expeditions, even their workshops are all fabulous. Because first of all, all of the instructors are professional photographers with National Geographic. And National Geographic takes photographs that are out of this world so there just from the get-go this is not some amateur photographer or even a professional this is a national geographic uh, travel photography or photography professional fabulous they're geared to amateur photographers they're not these courses are not geared to professionals now professionals I'm sure uh, will get something out of it but it's geared to all levels of people in terms of their photography skills. So if you don't know anything about it, they can help you get started for sure. They give you intensive instruction. You learn about photography technique. You have uh, critique sessions. They teach you how to edit photos. You do in-field photo shoots. I mean, they have these photography courses in, in expeditions worked out and organized it is just fabulous and also on top of all that they're great fun and you meet a lot of like-minded people and there's really good camaraderie so to whet your appetite just a little bit about what some of the types or some of the trips that national geographic offers i'll give you just some quickly First of all, can you imagine yourself in Morocco? Mm. They have a Morocco photography tour 10 days. Another one is Tanzania photo safari. That one I'm interested in taking nine days. Mongolia photography expedition 12 days. That should be great because Mongolia, you know, is just in the middle of nowhere, but it has a lot of unique aspects to their culture and how it relates to the landscape or, you know, the geography where they are. And I'm sure that one is just fantastic. India by rail expedition. So you not only get to see India, but you see India on a five-star, beautifully renovated train. And then you also are having photography courses and taking photographs. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, Cuba and its people. That one is becoming very popular. That one's eight days. And then uh, another one is the New York City Smartphone Photography Workshop is the one that I took. And I kind of I want to kind of go through my evolution as a uh, photographer or someone that uh, takes photographs and posts them on social media, my blogs, website, everything, and, and really how pathetic I was <laughs> <laughs> and how completely just uh, I had such an inferiority complex and I can I can credit National Geographic and just a two-day workshop completely changed my life in this in this way but you know I had wanted to take uh, for really, I'd, I'd say two years, one of their co- uh, courses, because I knew how important high-quality photographs were. I mean, I would look at other bloggers' photographs, uh, photographs on Instagram, Twitter, 
uh, and of course Facebook, but I would look at the quality and how they would capture uh, emotion or the colors. And, you know, I kept saying, I, I, why can't I do that? I mean, I kept trying, and it, it, it was just, I just felt so insecure about everything. And my husband, who's an architect, any picture that he takes looks fabulous. Now, he, I always say there's something about how his eyes are. He's, he can see birds and trees from way off. I mean, he just sees. <laughs> But he takes fabulous pictures just easy, and I could never take any. So I was a total novice when I started uh, this venture, and I really had to just decide that I I have to get over this. I have to dive in, and I have to figure out how to get my photographs on a, a, a high enough level to where I can be uh, effective, okay? So I went and bought myself a new camera, expensive camera. <laughs> I even got a GoPro, a drone, and then what? my iPhone. I mean, I decided I'm going to get the equipment, first of all. <laughs> then the the uh, techs who, the uh, young kids who work for IBM, who are all great uh, photo takers who developed my first blog, they gave me some basic photography lessons on both the camera and the iPhone. Well, that helped me get started. But I have to say, my first year, 85% of my photographs were awful. I really, they were still awful. I mean, I might have captured something really well, but there's a pole right in the middle of it. Or there's there's somebody sticking their hand somewhere that I can't crop. I mean, it just, there. it was like, like I said, 85% of my pictures, there was something wrong with them. And you, if you are doing what I do and traveling and taking photographs and using them for uh, uh, material for your blog or website or whatever, you have to have a better ratio than 85%. <laughs> so, you know, I was just so frustrated. So I just decided I couldn't go on one of these longer National Geographic trips. But I, I just last year I said, I have got to take one of their uh, uh, workshops at least to to really uh, get a get get on a higher level, and I found myself uh, taking more and more photographs with my iPhone. My iPhone, I could take better photographs, and I kept saying, "This expensive camera." I mean, I know I'm not doing right with exposure and some of the focusing and everything, but I would put it on automatic or turn the little dial to, you know, nature or what. I mean, I was trying everything, but it just, it was my smartphone. I was getting higher quality photographs. So I decided I'm going to New York City. I'm going to do this workshop. It was, it, it really did. It changed my life in terms of uh, photography and taking quality photographs. So I must say, I, I do plan to take uh, one or two more of their courses with my expensive camera because I would like to. Let's maybe, get some use out of it. Yeah, yeah my <laughs> GoPro and my drone, but I have to, you know, take baby steps. But I, I've made a lot of progress. Listeners, when you when you see some drone footage of us uh, <laughs> <laughs> podcasting, that would be that would be pretty fun. <laughs> well, I, I I mean I know how to get the drone off the ground. <laughs> It's just keeping it in the air and the, the photographs and everything. I'm worried I'm going to run into somebody. It's going to go haywire. <laughs> oh, yeah, no kidding. I know you always have tips, and that's what listeners are here for. But before we get to that, could you speak a little bit about something about the challenge of photos? Or maybe we can call it the pressure of taking photos, especially in our social media age. How do you suggest that solo travelers get the snaps that they want, but that they don't get so carried away that they are taken out of the moment, they're taken out of the experience of their travel. How not to get carried away with taking photos that it's disruptive to your travel experience, 
could be somewhat of a problem, <laughs> and especially when you're traveling with someone else or with a group. And I can tell you, my daughter, when I travel with her, she is so aggravated when I'm just taking photographs, especially when I first started out. You just take pictures of everything. You're just shooting, shooting, shooting. You you don't know what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. But it was so off-putting to my daughter because we were stopping the flow of our conversation or where we were going or whatever with this incessant <laughs> picture taking that I was doing. Well, that, that's like the stereotype of somebody taking so many pictures. It's like, how are you even enjoying this trip? <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, maybe you should go solo with your <laughs> You take if you plan to take a, a lot of uh, photographs, which I highly recommend, but it can be a distraction. So um, you know, and and like if you are traveling solo and taking a lot of, uh, or you plan to take a lot of photographs, you have to plan for that. You just allocate more time mm. to take those photographs, and you know, like. Even to the point where if you want to take some, say, photographs of St. Mark's Square, don't just go into the square and take one from this angle or from this viewpoint or from up above or whatever. Sit in one of the cafes and, like, sit there for an hour or more and observe and then start framing in your mind what angles or what part of the the architecture you want or do you want to focus on the pigeons or whatever it is but if you sit and observe and kind of try to plan what you're wanting to capture it's much better than just walking around the square and shooting all kinds of pictures so that takes more time so you have to kind of you know plan for it then Sometimes, I mean, you just have to let a shot go. Like, say if you want to get, you know, uh, some landmark and and it, it, everything just works against you. You can't get close enough to it or, you know, uh, uh, it, something prevents you from uh, uh, really getting ready to shoot it or whatever takes you away from You just got to let it go. Now, I say that, but I am such a dogged uh photo taker now and the the gentleman Ed Cashy who's just such a famous photographer with National Geographic told us all in the class look when you start taking photographs it is so hard not to quit taking photographs it's like you just you just become obsessed <laughs> with it and it is a little bit that way and I can say I remember on my last trip to San Francisco about six weeks ago I was down at the wharf and I wanted to uh, well, before I got there, I wanted to take a, a, a nice photograph of Coit Tower because it's a very distinctive landmark, and it was kind of getting towards dusk. And so uh, I never could get close enough or get a good angle to get the, the photograph uh, from where I was standing. So I finally had to get in the cab and go back to the hotel because I had something I had to be, uh, a function I had to be at at 7 o'clock. And so I thought the cab was racing along the waterfront and the side streets that were coming in, I looked the first one, I, I could see Coit Tower. So I got my smartphone out and every time we went past the uh, uh, side street, I would try to get Coit Tower. <laughs> and I must have taken 25 photographs and I got one spectacular one. Now, let me tell you, I could have let it go. But I didn't, and I, I, I kept on, and I did get one. But that's, that, and I share that with you because that's, that's how difficult this is. So, you know, you, you have to know that it's going to take you some time. You have to plan for it and try not to put too much pressure on yourself, but stay at it. You know, just stay at it, and, you know, you'll, you'll probably get enough taking photos that you love and basically that you uh, you're proud of is is a challenge I, I must say the pressure of getting that it shot is very real uh, if you're serious about taking quality photographs and in the 
the teachers that I had in the workshop with National Geographic, they'll all say the same thing. Now, you know, they've been doing it a long time. They know all the skills, techniques, and they've proven award-winning photographers. But it is it is a challenge, and it always remains a challenge. Sometimes, you know, the, they say they'll go days and days without getting some really it photographs. So... The challenge is always there. Uh, but before I get into some real specific uh, tips, I'll just share some broad uh, suggestions that I have experienced that kind of, I guess, before you get into the real technical tips, you kind of have to get this down or, or in your mind and, and start uh, doing this. The first one is just relax. Relax about this. I know uh, when I was trying to take pictures, I was trying so hard to get this lined up just right and all this kind of stuff. You know, it's it, it just relax about it. Try to see what you're doing and get it like you want to. And just relax. Do, I, I tell you, just by being relaxed, you're not going to mess up as many p- pictures. It's just funny how that works. So, when when you start out, just 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 be loose. Be, you know, be, relax. Second thing is make a list of kind of what your your uh, subject matter, what you want to fo- photograph that day. Do you want to focus on nature? Do you want to focus on portraiture? Are you going to uh, do uh, Take shots mostly of architecture or, you know, people interacting with each other. Make a list of what you think you want to shoot that day before you go shoot. Now, that doesn't mean you'll end up shooting that that much. Something will, you'll get carried away and in the moment this is much better. But you need to kind of focus yourself and, how you, and think about how you want to, uh, to do this. I mean... Do you want to take only silhouette shots of people this day or something that you want to specifically shoot that day? You should do that before you even start out, okay? Then um, once you start out, then just observe. And I know this, you know, this sounds logical, and of course you're going to observe when you take pictures. But when I say observe, observe everything, like you know, whether the soles of somebody's shoes are clean or not, or uh, if somebody didn't close their purse all the way. I mean, I'm telling you, you need to really, and look for that bird in the tree way far away that my husband can see all the time. You have to develop your ability to observe. And the more you do it in a way that is, you're focusing on it, you will observe more. So observe, observe, observe. Think that way. And then anything that catches your eye, whether you think it's weird or kind of off-putting or comical or whatever, anything that just pops out to you, take take pictures of it. Take pictures of it at different angles. Uh, you know, and just it, just try to capture in the picture what drew you or stimulated your emotion to take that photograph? It and it's it's it just just go with that flow. You might not be successful at first, but the more you do that, the more you will end up ca- capturing what I say really great photographs or that it photograph. Okay, if you're shooting people portraiture, always ask somebody if you can take their picture because I even myself have taken some pictures and I have gotten some really what I call some bad stares back and I realized at that time that I I I was being rude and I didn't think about it so remember that you know when you're out if you see something whatever and if it's somebody just say do you mind if I take your picture or I you know I'm doing this and I need to have somebody in the picture to give it some scale would you mind that'll go a long way you'll get a much better picture of them (laughs) if if you ask them and then if go Of course, if they don't want to, uh, then don't take the picture. Another thing is I have what's called a bandolier uh, phone case. And this is an appliance that it's actually a cover 
for the back of the phone, but the front of the phone is exposed. And it's on a little strap that I can use. It's crossbody. So I wear this phone with this bandolier attachment whenever I am out shooting photos because that camera is right there always ready and I can tell you if you have it in something where you have to pull it out just that extra little step you'll you could miss what you're seeing I mean the bird could fly off <laughs> or whatever so I really suggest you looking at some kind of accessory like this. I like the bandolier, uh, and I've had a lot of success with it, but it is great because, it, it, you know, you're ready to take a photograph at any time with that. Last, just basic, shoot, shoot, shoot. Just take lots of pictures because you can always delete them, and you'll be surprised. You might shoot one out of ten and that one is almost perfect, and all you have to do is crop one little thing or maybe adjust the exposure just a little bit. But the other nine, you can't make that it shot. So shoot, 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 and the garbage ones, just delete them. Okay, so let's, let's get into it. What tips do you have for travel photography? Okay, well... I am going to uh, defer to basically the tips that I got from my uh, National Geographic smartphone photography workshop. I think they're great. Uh, Ed Cashy, who was our instructor, is a uh, award-winning photojournalist and filmmaker. Uh, he was just great. I mean, he was such um, a well-traveled just relaxed and uh, brilliant man, and especially with photography. So he was a really wonderful instructor with the other two National Geographic photographers. They were great. So I'm going to use or share with you their, uh, you know, uh, tips because I think they're fabulous. And a little bit about that course. First of all, it was two days. We, you know, we first met and we had an overview by Mr. Cashy and the others and basically shared the structure of the class that we would have three different uh, field trips where we were given uh, photo assignments, whether it was portraiture or, you know, architecture or just street scenes, different lighting, um, you know, trying to capture low light or high light, et cetera. Our particular uh, stops were um, the High Line, which was very interesting. The, you know, this is that pedestrian walkway where there are a lot of different activities that go along. And it's just a very uh, in place it, to, to go to. So People watching heavy. Oh, yeah, yeah. But it was difficult to shoot photographs there because there were so many people. See, this is the thing. When there are a lot of people to capture one focal point or to capture something that is worth taking a picture that your your eyes don't get all you know you can't you can't get anything out of the photograph because there are too many things mm. in it that are disturbing it's it's hard it's hard to take i'll never forget uh one of the classmates she was a great picture t photographer and she took a picture of the inside of a hot dog stand that i thought was the most fabulous photograph of that highline and it was amazing she she had the the gentleman inside who was making a hot dog and she kind of caught him at just the right angle doing it and and kind of giving it to the and and just the whole thing i mean i don't like hot dogs but it made me want to <laughs> eat one <laughs> <laughs> and 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 so you know we had we had that field trip we had we had to go to Times Square oh my god Times Square at dusk and then turning to night that was really hard with all those people and low light and high light we had to do things with reflection we had to get portraiture oh that was difficult too 
And then the last one, we went to the 9-11 mm. uh, area with the Oculus and the 9-11 Memorial and just everything around there, which is, you know, the One World Trade Center. It, it's just such fertile ground for some just beautiful and very uh, emotive fo- uh, photo taking there. Those were the three places. It, it, you know, instead of the Oculus and the 9-11 area, they... Uh, The workshop usually goes to Central Park, but for some reason they wanted to do that, which turned out great, I think. But after every field trip, we would have to come back and critique. We have to take our five best pictures, put them on a big screen, the whole class critiques, and the teachers critique. And let me tell you, like I said at the beginning of the show, I had no confidence in my... Uh, photography skills and I felt like oh god I just felt so dumb (laughs) compared to those the the other classmates but I you know I just mustered up my desire and my courage and I I kept doing it and each time we would come back after you know uh, out being out in the field they I knew I was doing better per se but uh, it was quite a challenge so we had the the critique and the editing session then we had a lot of instruction on on basically the techniques and the tips which I'm going to get ready to give to you. So that was great. And uh, they ended up making a nice video with all of our photographs for us to keep. And we had a great, uh, nice farewell dinner at Sarah Beth's, which is a very cool restaurant in New York. So it was just a wonderful experience. And really, it, there, it was very substantive and uh, I highly recommend it. So that's a little bit about the particular course and, and how it's structured. And these are, are some of the tips and the techniques that they gave us. First of all, always have your smartphone ready. You know, just be ready to shoot the shot. Ed Cashy walks around with his, with his uh, phone out. And even when he's talking to other people or whatever. He's shooting shots. He's shooting shots. He's so good that he kind of knows what he needs to do. And then, of course, he crops and everything and edits them. But, I mean, he not only is always ready to shoot, he's shooting too if he's doing something else, but his eye is so Mm. good. But always be ready to shoot. And like I said, I use the bandolier little crossbody a phone case that doesn't have a front over the phone itself. So I'm all, always ready to shoot. So I really, that's number one. Then number two, composition. Now when you're looking at something that you want to take a photograph of, you have to kind of think about the rule of thirds, basically, the tic-tac-toe rule. Because in your camera, there is basically like a tic-tac-toe board that is behind the picture where you'll have uh, uh, horizontal lines and vertical lines. So you'll have like nine squares, just like tic-tac-toe. Well, you want to get the subject of what you're taking, the focal point, at one of the intersections, the four intersections Mm. on that. Don't take it straight on. The best photographs are a little off-center because they need some kind of line in it or something uh, uh, just aesthetically. And all smartphones and good cameras, all you have to do is hit it a little bit. You'll see where where it is. So, you know, I, I never knew that that existed. You know, so that was great. That was like a eureka moment for me. The next thing is the zooming. Now, I didn't even know what zooming was on the camera until last year when I went around the world. And in Lisbon, I saw this one gentleman. I was trying to take a a sunset, and he was doing I said, what are you doing? You can zoom on the iPhone? And he said, oh, yeah. So he showed me. So I, I zoomed. Well, I learned at this class, don't zoom. Take the photograph and zoom afterwards. And then crop. Your photographs will be, the resolution is much better than you zoom and and take the photograph after you've zoomed. Do you see my stunned face? I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what they said. 
So, and then uh, third, or excuse me, fourth is the point of view. Now, this is the angle which you want to take your subject. And uh, Ed said, you know, experiment with interesting angles. Lie down. You know, uh, look up at your subject or, or shoot it from above or diagonally or from behind. You know, just think about different angles in which to capture a more powerful uh, expression or a statement of what you're taking a picture of. So that, you know, that just takes experiments. It takes it takes practice of seeing that way. Now the phones are so good now that in the cropping section you can you can change the angle yourself. Now you can't change it from above or, or below, but you can you can cock it to one side and, and crop it and do different things. But uh, point of view. So so think about you know would it be better if I uh, shot this little kid from looking up at him when he's eating a uh, popsicle rather than down on him. You know, it, there are a lot of different things, and, you know, I'm not that good at it yet to really see it, but you need to be aware, loosen up on just taking straight at something, okay? Use two hands for stability. Now, this is common sense. You know, hold a phone in your left hand, you know, hit the button with your right. Now, if you're left-handed, it's opposite. Swap it, yeah. But, but basically, you got to be steady. It's important that, you know, the you're steady when you take the photograph. And sometimes I'll even hold my breath to make sure I'm really steady. Now, you know, I have a tripod and all that, but I, I've yet to really... Use it. I mean, like I said at the beginning of the show, I bought everything. I mean, I've got the equipment. <laughs> so, okay, next is for high-speed action shots like sports or wildlife moving, use, your, use an expensive camera because you can't get those shots in still life. Mm. On the uh, on the iPhone, that's what the the teacher says. It's you, you'll get them, but it's not going to be really good quality. So if you want to shoot something like that, do it in video off the phone. Don't try to capture just one shot is uh, like a line in motion or something. It'll be very hard to get it because those good phones, they can take so many pictures real quick, and they they can the exposure and the focusing and everything is just. That was tip number six. Okay, number seven is keep the composition simple. Now, you want to have a focal point or some uh, focus of every particular photograph, whether it's somebody's foot or, you know, somebody's hand or a bird or whatever is what you want to capture that will speak to whoever is looking at the photograph. Because one of the things they kept saying in this course is you always want to take photographs that will draw the the looker in to look at the photograph and will create some kind of emotion and hopefully some kind of really a bond or something about the photograph that gets to their their real uh it talks to them it speaks to them and it, it, you know ed kept saying you know some of the most simple things that people do like drinking a glass of water if you can get it at the right angle with the right light and them kind of looking up maybe they're thinking before they you know get ready to finish their meal. It's all those things put together. So when you're looking at your composition, think like that. What's going to be the focal point and kind of what do I want to share about this with whoever is going to look at the photographs? And the more you do that, the more you're able to do that with, uh, with some skill. Okay, and then also, you know, they they said look for patterns like repetition patterns. Say there are 
the little reflectors, street reflectors in the middle of the road. Well, kind of take your photograph to where the eye would go down it and it, some middle point is what you're trying to shoot. So look for lines in buildings mm. or uh, repetition of patterns, whether it's windows or something that repeats, something that takes your eye to the line and it kind of gets you to exactly where you uh, your the the focal point of your photo. So keep your composition simple, but look at look at what is actually going on in that second when you're taking a photograph. I mean, I know a lot of times I'm trying to take photographs inside, like a restaurant or something, because I'm a blog about it. I mean, I have to take sometimes. 15, 20 pictures because, you know, somebody will get up, the waiter will go, you know. I mean, it, it's just so hard right. to, but, you know, I know I want to get this particular angle, everybody happy in the picture, and, you know, those kinds of things. It takes a while to do, but uh, keep your composition simple. Next one is light is the key. Oh, God. This one is hard because I don't think I, I see that well mm. to begin with. But, you know, light is so important. You can take a shot a hundred times, and if the light's bad, all hundred pictures are going to be bad. But if the light is really good, that particular shot that will be absolutely out of this world if the light is good couple of little tips about light if you are taking like portraits or uh, pictures of people don't uh, avoid the the direct sun in their face anything that's directly the sun is too much on to people you, you get all kinds of weird looking you, you know I mean first of all they have to squint but you know even if they're not squinting it's something it's too harsh it takes the it takes the um quality out of out of what's in the photograph some kind of way uh, and then, you know, they said that bright overcast, or look for those kind of days, which means it's sunny, but they're clouds. That's usually the quality of the light is very good. They also like, they kept saying slight fogs are real good. When it's just a little foggy, just that little essence of the fog, something about it really can create some really um, photographs that you, that you remember. Another uh, tip dealing with light, there is what's called the magic hour. And the magic hour is right at dawn for about an hour. And then uh, the other hour is right at dusk for an hour. And this is when the natural light all over the world which is different, you know, uh, obviously different time zones. It's The sun is a different place and different angle. But at this magic hour is when the light is the most intense and the photographs are wonderful. And professional photo photographers get up really early to take great photographs. You know, they get up before the sun comes up, they go sit, and they stage what they want to do, and they take it during the magic hour, as well as the same thing in the in the evening when it's dusk till uh, the sun goes down. This, I mean, I must say, I, that is the truth, because I have done it when it's in the magic hour and when it's not. This photographing the same area and the quality of the photographs are completely different. And what's so good now is you have apps that tell you exactly mm. when the when it is the magic hour and when it will be. And they even have little things that, you know, pop up and remind you. Hey, like, take your pictures now. <laughs> yeah, or in 10 minutes, the magic hour will yeah. start. <laughs> but but that uh, that is uh, that is really, it's, it's, yeah, it's cool. really kind of, uh, it's wondrous or something. So, uh, you know, read a little bit up about the magic hour and why it's so good, et cetera, and, and take some photographs during that time. Number 10, be on the lookout for good reflection. Now, this is something I never thought about before I took uh, the course. Things that reflect, like, you know, we've all taken photographs not, not on purpose for the reflection, 
but it's there. Uh, like, say, if you're taking a photograph of a lake and you're really trying to, say, take uh, a, a some people boating on one side. Well, on maybe some of the photograph, you get a wonderful reflection of the water and, you know, basically the landscape, and you have the inverse of the landscape. Now, when you really start taking photographs and you try to take good ones, you're always looking for hints of reflection and how to take photographs that have reflection in it. Some of those can be the most outstanding and interesting photographs. So they said look for water pu- look at water puddles, <laughs> windows, especially skyscrapers, you know, with a lot of glass, mirrors, anything that's a shiny object. Well, I started taking what I call reverse selfies, which was if I would see something that was reflecting, just like if you go in the bathroom, but you know what I'm saying? I mean, I know this sounds goofy, but I was trying to use some of it, and it's it's amazing. There's something about the reflection, too, that gives a... There's something about the quality of light or something. So that's another one. Uh, look for good reflections. Next one is look for people or objects to create sense of scale, especially mm. if you, you know, you something big and expansive. You'll see gorgeous photographs of the desert and dunes. Well, it's much more interesting if you have two or three people on the left-hand side at that intersection on tic-tac-toe on Campbell's. It, you just see it better than just this great expanse. I mean, you'll you'll if the picture's well taken and the light's right, et cetera, it'll be nice. But with the camels and the people on it, it will ground you more. It's it's just it's just one of the things that they shared is when you take photographs, you need to have some kind of object or or person to create uh, a sense of scale, especially if if it's. Uh, you know, a lot bigger than you or a lot smaller than you. Something that, that you know, brings the photograph into uh, a, a realistic kind of um, Perspective, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, next one, very common sense, keep your phone dry and clean. I mean, you know, you got to protect it from water because you get too much, forget it, and dust, mess up your pictures. So keep it, uh, you know, uh, protect it from water and dusk. And they, you know, there are all kinds of little uh, films now that you can put over your smartphone that you definitely need to do that because you're going to drop it and, you know, it's going to get dirty and uh, and it, water will get on it. So you need to get one of those. Next one is when shooting portraits, look for soft, indirect light. Now, if you want to shoot somebody's face or you want to shoot uh, just a person, like sitting down, maybe eating uh, a cone with gelato or just something, you you want to look. You don't want, well, like I said, you don't want the, the sun to be directly in their face. You... They shared it's better to have some kind of indirect light. Like they said, they showed some pictures that light coming through a window and and hitting the person, say, at their shoulder Mm. where you could see it on their face but wasn't directly on the face. And the face had a certain angle, etc. So you want kind of indirect light on the subject matter. Uh, You know, straight light as I shared, is a, is a complete no-no. Also, take a lot of photographs from the different angles if you want to do portraiture. Talk to them. Sing. Have music. You know, that's you can catch, capture some good portraiture if you do those things. Okay? Then uh, number 14 is... Look for abstract shots and humor. I mean, they were all at that. Look for all the weird things. I mean, that was one thing I got. You know, uh, think outside the box when you're taking photographs. I mean, just just look for it's things that you would never think were good to take. Just just keep observing. 
you know, whether it's uh, graffiti, street art, I mean, lots of people take photographs of that now because it's so popular. But, you know, uh, I remember when I was growing up, they had candid camera, which was, you know, filming people doing crazy things or in bad situations. Well, you don't want to take something that's hurtful to somebody or embarrassing. But look for shots that, you know, somebody is just a look of amazement or they're just, you know, look for these these different kind of expressions or, or situations that, of course, are not, that off-putting, unless you're you're uh, documenting, you know, poverty in some place or something like that. But you know, look for for abstract shots or shots that are just funny. <laughs> you know, people can do some funny things, like wear some really, you know, funny clothes. I remember I saw this one guy, and I took a picture of him. I didn't ask him if I could, but I just walked past him. He was in the New Orleans airport. He was reading a, something, and he looked, he didn't look like he was kind of off. He he looked like a lawyer, to tell you the truth. He he had a, a little small hat on, so you could really see his face, but he had a clown nose on him. Oh. And I thought, what is he doing? It's not Mardi Gras. Uh, you know, but obviously he was doing that. He was either going somewhere where he had to have it or it was symbolized something or he was just wanting to be weird and funny. But he wasn't weird looking. That's what I'm yeah, trying yeah. to say. So I thought, I, I tried, but I didn't get a good picture of it. But, you know, to see somebody who's, say, like reading you know, a novel or something that looks like a distinguished person with a with a red clown nose on their nose. It that was really I went, whoa, what's going on here? <laughs> then last is use your smartphone editing capabilities. And let me tell you something. The capabilities now are so fabulous. That was one of the biggest things I learned from that class. You can take so many garbage photographs and really crop them and uh, change the exposure and the contrast and the shadows and, and filters and uh, uh, structure. You can do so much that it has revived, I know, maybe 40% of the 85 bad percent that I took. I mean, I'm getting ready to post a photograph tonight of uh, on my social media of a, a Russian samovar. And this is a big kind of tall, uh, unique tea kettle that they brew boiling water and then the tea on top of it, real strong tea. And it's it's very symbolic in the Russian culture. It's, a first of all, a symbol of hospitality. And, you know, the Russians love to drink tea and, and talk and kind of, uh, you know, get it together and go back out and do whatever they need to do. Well, I, I uh, took some photographs of a very pretty samovar in a, a hotel restaurant, and they had a nice spread with the little uh, Russian dolls and then the, you know, the toast and everything else for breakfast. Well, I thought when I took the photograph that it was good. Well, when I saw the few that I took, oh, I thought, there's just too much going on. The stage is in the back because it was in this real fancy restaurant that they have a live performance in the evening. And uh, But when I was going through my photographs to, to post something on uh, Russia, I saw it and I said, let me see if I can edit this <laughs> and focus this and bring it just to... Uh, right on the samovar with one of the dolls and then do the light just right. I think I have a knocked out photograph that I'm going to share tonight on my social media. But that's strictly because I was able to use the cropping, enhancing the color, highlighting, exposure, sharpen the contrast. I mean, these... Uh, these filters and things that this iPhone can do is just absolutely out of this world. I mean, uh, and I can't wait till the iPhone 8 comes out. They're supposed to, the cameras and everything is supposed to be even better. better. Oh, yeah. So those are the 15 basic tips 
that uh, National Geographic, you know, kept talking to us and kept, when they were editing our photos, they would say, well, you should have, what about this angle? Or, you know, that was too much direct sunlight and blah, 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 all that. So I'll just kind of uh, close this particular uh, podcast with, if I could learn <laughs> how to take quality photographs, anyone, anyone can. And I really do highly recommend National Geographic, their photography ex- expeditions or the workshops, because, you know, they will get you focused in the right direction, You'll definitely learn the basic photography techniques and you'll end up beginning to shoot photos that you're really proud of. And you'll know, you'll have confidence. You might not get it, but you know what's a good photograph. If anybody who's listening to this is not following Astrid on social media, you are missing out because there's some great photos you're posting all the time. Astrid's on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, But you know what is the perfect picture of stress-free travel planning? A helpful and comprehensive packing list. Astrid has one. You can get your own copy of Astrid's complimentary packing list. Just go to astridtravel.com, download the packing list. It's right there on the front page. And in fact, it, it will also be with this show on the podcast section of her website, astridtravel.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts. SoundCloud, Stitcher, and we're making a special call. If you like what you're hearing, if you're enjoying the show and you want other people to know about Solo Travel Talk, please give us a rating on any of those platforms. I, I Maybe some people can send you some of the pictures they're taking on their solo adventures. That would be pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'd be happy to uh, post them and uh, maybe even if they want me to respond, you know, do... <laughs> What do you think I should have done? Or what do you, you know? I, I mean, I've, I've, I must say, I have, I have um, increased my confidence so yeah. much at knowing what a good photograph is that uh, I, I could probably uh, share some, some, you know, suggestions. More specific. Tips. Oh yeah. yeah, that's great. Yeah. And I, I want to share it at the very end. And this, I don't want to sound uh, it, that I'm uh, bragging or anything. But uh, National Geographic did post five of the photos I love that it. I took, and they're still on their website Woo-hoo! as, you know, just some of the uh, participants' photos that they did. So I learned a lot, and, and it's they're, they're just National Geographic. I, I, they're just the best at everything they do. Well, that's what I started with, the gold standard. They really are. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. We look forward to seeing you next week on Solo Travel Talk. Thank you for listening to Solo Travel Talk. Follow Astrid on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. To learn more about Astrid or Solo Travel Advisors, visit our website, astridtravel.com.